On December 8, 1968, a crowd of more than 1,000 people gathered in an auditorium and they were about to see the future be unveiled right in front of them. In the same year of 1968, one of the most futuristic films ever made was released, 2001 A Space Odyssey which depicted the super sophisticated HAL 9000. For the many millions who watched the film and were in awe of the sophisticated machine, none among them knew just how close that depicted feature was. A few months after the release of the movie, a scientist by the name Douglas Ingobot sat in front of a crowd of hundreds and after a brief introduction asked the audience an intriguing question. If in your office, you as an intellectual worker were supplied with a computer display backed up by a computer that was alive for you all day, instantly responsive to every action you had, how much value could you derive from that? Thereafter, he began to unveil the very future we are currently living in. This is a story of a man whose ideas formed the foundation of modern computing and how all those ideas were stolen by people who went on to be revered as innovators and titans of industry. In the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, we are introduced to HAL. HAL was a futuristic computer with a human personality capable of many functions. To illustrate just how technologically ahead of its time Ingobart's presentation was, 2001 A Space Odyssey was lauded for being ahead of its time. It was like the creators had gone into the future and showed it to people in the 60s. Douglas Ingobart pierced the veil of the present and showcased the future that laid behind it. And unlike 2001 A Space Odyssey, this wasn't fiction, it was real. Ingobot started his presentation by posing a very provocative question. Then he began to type using a keyboard. Text appeared on the screen, word for word. In the following hour, he demonstrated text editing, video conferencing, hypertext, and windowing. The brilliance of his invention was not simply limited to how intuitive the digital interface was, the physical innovations were also quite brilliant. While navigating his machine, Douglas Ingobart was using a pointer tracking device. As the device moved, a pointer on the screen would follow along. He called it the mouse. He had created a system that made computers far more capable and usable, both digitally and physically. Then he showed how his system could be networked, allowing for interactive computing that would allow information to be shared rapidly among collaborating scientists and engineers. Ingobart called his system the online system, or NLS for short. The audience was left in awe. This was a pivotal moment in tech history, and the demo would go on to be dubbed the mother of all demos. The vision Engelbart presented was a culmination of 17 years of imagination and scientific innovation. In the spring of 1951, Engelbart was working at NACA, the precursor to NASA. He'd come a long way from his depression era childhood in rural Oregon, where he'd spent his days roaming the woods and tinkering in the barn. In 1945, Engelbart had read with interest Vannevar Bush's article, As We May Think, a call to action for making knowledge widely available. He had also read something about the recent phenomena of computer and from his experience as a radar technician, he knew that information could be analyzed and displayed on a screen. While at NACA, it hit him, a vision of intellectual workers sitting at display working stations, flying through information space, harnessing their collective intellectual capacity to solve important problems together in much more powerful ways. Harnessing collective intellect facilitated by interactive computers became his mission at a time when computers were viewed as number crunching tools. At that time, there were relatively few computers in the world and they were the size of rooms, nothing like the ones Ingobart envisioned. But even in their nascent state, Ingobart was eager to work with computers. He later found himself at Stanford Research Institute. While at SRI, he published a paper titled Augmenting the Human Intellect, a Conceptual Framework. At the core of the paper was the idea that computers could augment human intelligence. He outlined innovative ways of manipulating and viewing information and then sharing it over networks so people could work together. The paper sparked a lot of interest, which led to funding from ARPA to launch his work. Ingobart recruited a research team in his new augmentation research center, the lab he founded at SRI to pursue the ideas outlined in his paper. He and his new recruits developed computer interface elements such as bitmap screens, the mouse, hypertext, collaborative tools, and precursors to the graphical user interface. Ingobart applied for a patent under SRI in 1967 and received it in 1970. The patent was for a wooden child with metal wheels, now known as a computer mouse 
which he had developed with Bill English, his lead engineer. Engelbart later revealed that it was nicknamed the mouse because the tail came out of the end. All these innovations were presented at the mother of all demos. There was very real excitement during the presentation and the crowd had been mesmerized. At the end of his demo, the audience stood up and gave him a standing ovation and then filed out of the auditorium back to their normal lives. Engelbart thought the audience members would line up afterwards to ask how they could join his project and help develop and spread his ideas. But the response was anything but. Engelbart wondered why. Was it perhaps that he was too forward thinking for his time? Because the system presented a radical change in how work could be done. So radical that even the technically savvy engineers in the crowd would struggle to fathom using the system at their normal 9 to 5s. So they simply decided going back to their punch cards and room sized computers was better. For the next couple of years, Ingobard pursued the answer to his question. He focused the efforts of the lab not on more innovation but rather on educating people on how to use the online system. He hired people whose job it was to explain how the system works to people all over the country but this didn't prove very successful. The talented engineers grew frustrated with the drastically slower pace of innovation and simultaneously were not allowed to make any changes to the online system because Ingobot had a tendency to flat out reject any changes to his system even if the ideas presented would have made it easier to use facilitating greater adoption by the public. In his eyes, the system was perfect as it was and it was people who needed to be taught how to use it as it was intended instead of him changing it for people to find it easier to use. He was an engineer at heart and gave very little thought to how non-technical persons may find it very difficult to use a system. He often ended discussions by declaring, you just don't get it. This catchphrase cost Engelbart dearly as it alienated him from his engineers and anyone willing to use his system. So many of his key engineers left in search of freedom to work on what they wanted and the freedom to implement their ideas, not to be micromanaged by a totalitarian boss. Funding also began drying up at the same time. His main funders, the government organization of ARPA, increasingly grew frustrated by the lack of application of the technology that Ingobar's lab had created. So they started moving funding to more readily applicable research projects. His research lab would later be shut down in the late 70s, with many of his former talented recruits ending up at Xerox Park. Yes, the very same Xerox Park that is often credited with the creation of the modern PC. To say Xerox Park's innovations may have never happened had it not been for Engelbart isn't an exaggeration. The park engineers used Engelbart's work as their foundation and further developed his vision into their various projects. Xerox software included user-friendly versions of a few of Engelbart's original ideas, including multiple windows, text with integrated graphics, and the mouse itself. A cruel joke at the time was that Engelbart's lab had been a training program for park engineers. When computer history is told, it is often pointed out that Microsoft and Apple stole from Xerox, but Xerox itself had stolen from Engelbart. In 1979, Xerox allowed Steve Jobs and other Apple executives to tour his labs. Once Jobs saw the mouse, he was mesmerized. Apple immediately licensed the mouse from the Stanford Research Institute and began working on their own version. Engelbart's mouse had three buttons, which he used in different combinations to perform a range of tasks. Apple decided it would be simpler to give it just one button. Engelbart lamented that Apple had dumbed down the mouse's capability to make it easy to use. The mouse would go on to be one of Engelbart's most famous inventions, with billions of them in existence today, but he only ever earned $10,000 from the Stanford Research Institute, who held the patent along with himself for this invention. He was bewildered that the simplest artifact from his grand vision had been the most widely embraced. After all, he'd foreshadowed just about everything Apple and Microsoft went on to create at a time when Jobs and Bill Gates were just 13 years old. Engelbart's career was characterized by brilliant engineering but poor social application. Fundamentally, Engelbart hated the idea of dumbing down his work as it would mean less effective results for his end goal and a compromise on his vision. Rather than change project direction or simplify his ideas, he remained rigid in his execution. His detractors snidely remarked that as the great proponent of collaboration he was, ironically, 
he was unable to collaborate. Engelbart's online system had a notoriously steep learning curve, but he believed the result was worth it. When people praised other software for being more intuitive, he asked them whether they'd rather ride a tricycle or a bicycle. Contrast that to those who went on to build out his vision, although dumped down. Steve Jobs with his ease of use approach and Bill Gates with his feature rich approach ultimately won the PC ideological wars for better or worse, and in the process experienced tremendous financial gain for their efforts. But on Ingolbart's part however, he never sought to own what he contributed to the world. What frustrated him the most was how so many people had adopted, developed and profited from the digital media he had helped create, while failing to pursue the important tasks he had created them to do. Engelbart's original vision for his system wasn't for everyone in the world to use it, but rather it was targeting intellectual and technical thinkers. He wanted to give them enhanced abilities to solve complex problems and help them work on extraordinary stuff collaboratively to further push the human race forward and accelerate the rate of innovation to solve the world's biggest problems as fast as possible. Instead, his vision was dumbed down into a machine for entertainment and menial clerical work. Although he earned over four scientific awards and had numerous patents to his name, Engelbart often felt demoralized. The vision his machine presented was the foundation upon which Xerox Park was built and the guidebook that Bill Gates and Steve Jobs followed to mass fortune and fame. Everything Microsoft and Apple have ever achieved rests on the shoulders of the genius of Douglas Engelbart's work. In fact, most of Silicon Valley's so-called innovations are simply Douglas Engelbart's vision dumbed down. The head of Xerox Park, Alan Kay, once said, I don't know what will happen when Silicon Valley runs out of Douglas Engelbart's ideas. In another world, Engelbart could have been both Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, the executor and the visionary, heralded for bringing the future to the present. But ultimately, he faded into obscurity, with only a few knowing of his true brilliance. He sadly passed away in 2013 after suffering from kidney failure. But his ideas, however dumbed down they have become, have truly changed the world. He stands as one of the very few figures in history who have a credible claim that had it not been for his work, the course of human history may have been dramatically different. Thank you for watching.